Welcome to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii, where we discuss the impact of change on workers, employers, and the economy. I'm your host, Cheryl Crozier Garcia, inviting you to join in the conversation. You can call us in the studio at area code 415 871 2474, or you can tweet us at ThinkTechHI. One of the issues that is affecting the workplace is the changing tone of political discussions. In the past, people could have spirited debates on political issues, and no one seemed to be harmed by legitimate differences of opinion. However, since the 2016 presidential election, we've seen a big change. Families have reported having to cancel holiday celebrations or purposely excluding those with very different opinions. We've heard in the news media of marriages and other relationships ending because the parties disagreed on the candidate's suitability for office. And the Society for Human Resource Management reports that 40% of HR professionals have had to intervene in water cooler conversations that became overly heated or had to counsel individuals about their actions towards coworkers who have divergent political opinions. Whatever happened to just be nice as a strategy for getting along with those with whom we disagree? Joining us today to discuss this change in our workplace is Dr. Tim Fallis, a communications professor at Hawaii Pacific University. Dr. Fallis has some advice for us about how to just be nice to one another. Welcome, Tim. Thank you, Cheryl. Delighted to be here. I'm glad you're here, too. Um, I'm sure that you've heard about some of these uh, political disagreements that have taken place in the home, at work, and in different, uh, in the media, and different political situations. What do you think the causes of these very sort of toxic discussions might be? Uh, yeah, in the classroom as well. It's mm -hmm. everywhere. Uh, I think in this political season, people are very passionate about the ideologies behind candidates. And they see that there is a, a bigger divergence than there has been before. Whether there really is or not doesn't really matter. Mm -hmm. But they think there is. And they feel so strongly about these perspectives that they can't imagine that people that they like, that they love, that they're friends with, that they work with, can possibly have a different opinion because they're so sure that they are right. Mm -hmm. And they feel like they're informed, and they feel like they're knowledgeable, they feel like they've paid attention to the media. And because they're not agreed with all the time, they imagine that an attack on their opinion is an attack upon themselves, upon their own character, their identity, their autonomy, their, their righteousness. Mm -hmm. And so they feel offended. And so they become angry and defensive. And I think, as well, people feel there's a huge stake in the American political conversation and where this country is going right now. Mm -hmm. And that there seems to be very polar opposites about which direction to go. Whether those uh, directions are that divergent or not, they think they are. And so they're very passionate. Mm -hmm. So when people say, uh, say you and I are having a political discussion, if I said I disagree, um, in the past you might have heard I disagree, but today you might hear I don't like you. Yes, I don't like you, I don't respect you, I think you're an imbecile, I think you're misinformed, you have no idea what you're talking about. You mm -hmm. must be a fool. You must be watching the wrong media. You must be misinformed. Mm -hmm. And then that's a personal attack. Um, I think people have lost sight. We're, we're told as, we, as a social norm as we grow up from our families or our schools that everyone has a right to their own opinion. If everyone has that right, then I do, then you do. Mm -hmm. And then it is incumbent upon me to respect your right to an opinion. And then incumbent upon you to respect mine. I think people are pretty good about that for the most part, or at least start off that way. What we don't learn so much is that, yes, you have the right to your opinion, and I must respect your right to that opinion. But that does not mean I need to respect the opinion. Mm -hmm. I can respect you and think that you're completely wrong. And the, I think understanding that allows for a separation between identity and, and position, and we've lost that. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that that loss has been encouraged, frankly, by um, political news media that has become very polarized, very siloed because there's so many options we can watch we have a myriad of choices where we can watch whatever agrees with us mm -hmm, frankly mm -hmm. and those shows are become increasingly bombastic increasingly passionate where only the the position of those in the show is right and everyone else must be a moron or uh, is not a patriot 
right? Or is uh, uh, selfish, evil, capitalist, miserable, patriarchal, you know, zombie. Mm -hmm. um, we're encouraged to, to think in those sort of really polarized ways, I think, by the media that we're watching, that we're getting our political information from. Mm -hmm. And so we lose this, this separation between personality and idea. Right. Does the same thing happen, um, do you think, uh, in regards to, say, uh, popular entertainment? I mean, one of the things that seems to be happening in media today is that uh, comedians and others who are, who make a living calling out the, the strange behaviors of people in the public eye are making jokes mm -hmm. that are not being perceived as jokes. Um, and we all know the role of the court jester mm -hmm. historically. It was the court jester's job to point out potential areas of injustice, meanness, unfairness, cruelty, mm -hmm. uh, in a way that made people laugh so that they could look at these issues in a, in a kind of non-threatening way. Um, what's happening with that? I mean, I, I look at Bill Maher's uh, ongoing uh, vitriol uh, that he's receiving regarding certain jokes that he's told about mm -hmm. our current president and his family. And I'm stunned because people have made jokes about presidential first daughters in my entire lifetime. I think the only one I haven't heard people make fun of is Caroline Kennedy. But everyone mm -hmm. else has gotten a f their, more than their fair share of jokes about various things. Um, but now, uh, these new jokes about Ivanka Trump are really exposing the comedian to some very, very vitriolic um, reviews and feedback. Mm -hmm. Why is that? I think it's, it's multi-layered and complicated. Um, jokes about Ivanka, I think, are unacceptable to people because of the, for some of them, the reasons they voted for Donald Trump to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, a reaction against eight years of a black president, frankly. Um, now we have a white American family, and isn't this woman lovely, and she's raising children, and she's well-educated, and she's powerful in business. Why aren't we respecting her and treating her like a most excellent person? Making fun of her is inappropriate, especially because um, folks who felt uncomfortable with Michelle Obama mm -hmm. were not permitted to make jokes about certain aspects of who she was, right? Because it was racist, because it was... Um, against social norms. Now it, people feel like that's unfair. But you're absolutely right. People are making fun of, the, of presidents' families forever. I mean, I, where I went to grad school, um, I was privileged to work with David Eisenhower and his wife, Julie Nixon, uh -huh. right? Um, both of whom were mercilessly treated by the press. I mean, uh, Creedence Clearwater Revival made a whole song about um, David Eisenhower, right? Uh -huh. uh, fortunate son. Um, he was mocked endlessly his whole life. And um, that's not new, as you point out. But in the moment, people are very, very offended. Again, because they see it as an attack on the identities that cause them to vote for this particular candidate. Mm -hmm. it's, it's personal. And, it, and um, comedic commentary, right, the, the carnivalesque, if you will, is no longer seen as this contributory medium where we get to sort of understand things in a non-threatening way. Now it's considered a threat mm -hmm. because it goes to a mocking of people's identity rather than a mocking of their position or their ideology. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. Although I have to say the adjectives you use to describe our current first daughter, mm -hmm. I really don't share with you. We have to dis agree to disagree on all of those Oh, I didn't say I agree with that. Noble qualities, right. Well, I don't agree necessarily. Well, she is educated. You can't disagree. No, she's she is, got a degree. She There's is, a difference. She is raising children. But that's, well. Uh, seem to be well-adjusted for maybe. the most part. Who knows? Um, yeah, she, I mean, clearly she has a job because, you know, her dad owned the company. Um, mm -hmm. But those are the positions that people take. Right. Yeah. It's, um, it's amazing. It is. It is. It, and, and this administration is clearly very different from the last administration, maybe from every administration we've had before it, mm -hmm. in its uh, very open disregard for the norms of how we do government, mm -hmm. of how we do democracy, of how we at least try to avoid the appearance of kleptocracy. kleptocracy. Mm -hmm. um, this administration seems unconcerned 
with upending those. In fact, they see that as their mission, mm -hmm. is to upend the norms of how we do government, of how we do statesmanship. Mm -hmm. um, actually, I haven't heard the word statesmanship in quite a while. Yeah. Um, it's not something that I think we can easily apply to this administration. Or diplomacy. Or diplomacy. Or Diplo tact. Diplomacy is actually considered a um, bourgeois evil, I mm -hmm. think, at this point. Um, a nicety of the liberal, liberal elites who uh, want to capitulate to other countries' interests, mm -hmm. uh, rather than as a, a very powerful tool to further the nation's interests, which is how just about every presidential uh, administration has treated it since George Washington. Right. And speaking of George Washington, even he, the father of our country, could be fairly easily accused of kleptocracy or nepotism. If mm -hmm. you look at some of his cabinet appointments and some of his staff appointments, he had um, a son-in-law son or step-son-in-law mm -hmm. uh, as his personal secretary. John Adams had John Quincy Adams as his secretary of state. Um, of course, President Kennedy had Robert Kennedy Robert as Kennedy. his attorney general. And so over time, there have been people who have believed that the people who would be most likely to defend their political agenda and mm -hmm. move it forward have been the people they felt they could trust the most, and that was family sure. or friends. I don't know that there's anything necessarily wrong with that if the person really is the most qualified for the position. But I think maybe in the case of our current president and the current cabinet and the current um, environment that the White House is surrounding itself with, it's hard to make the argument that the people that right. have been selected really are the best candidates and well-trained for the positions that they're being nominated for. Well, the qualification criteria is very different from what you're identifying. Mm -hmm. um, in the past, it was, okay, so this person is well-educated, well-experienced, is someone I know and trust. It actually made sense for John Kennedy to appoint Robert. Mm -hmm. It was, the, it was the, the finest state attorney general that he knew um, very well. In this administration, the qualifications have nothing to do with experience, and nothing right. to do with knowledge. They are entirely based on ideology and loyalty. If you, are, if you are, have the correct perspective, mm -hmm. and if you are loyal to this man, then you're qualified, then you're, you're good to go. Um, whether or not you're actually capable of doing diplomacy in China or uh, running the White House or I, I think it would take us the rest of the hour I think to name off all the things that Jared Kushner is now in charge of mm -hmm. is irrelevant. It's all about personal connection and, and, and it makes sense that Donald Trump's doing this actually based on his experience mm -hmm. since he's grossly unqualified to be president by experience or education. He has built a business empire based on yeah. personal connection right. and loyalty and a very yeah. transactional model. Yeah. And government is not transactional. You're right. Um, let's talk more about networking in just a minute. We have to go and talk about the network here at Think Tech Hawaii and all of the other great programming that our friends and colleagues are putting on for you. So we are going to take a break, but we will be back in a minute. You can hang around, right? Yes, great. thank you. We will be right back. This is Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. You can be the greatest, you can be the best, you can be the king come banging on your chest, you can beat the world, you can beat the war, you can talk to God, go banging on his door, you can throw your hands up, you can beat the clock. You can move a mountain, you can break rocks, you can be a master, don't wait for luck, dedicate yourself and you can find yourself. Aloha, my name is Stephen Philip Katz. I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I'm the host of Shrink Wrap Hawaii, where I talk to other shrinks. Did you ever want to get your head shrunk? Well, this is the best place to come to pick one. I've been doing this. We must have 60 shows with a whole bunch of shrinks that you can look at. I'm here on Tuesdays at 3 o'clock every other Tuesday. I hope you are too. Aloha. Welcome back to Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. Cheryl Crozier Garcia here discussing how to communicate effectively with those who have different political discussion or um, opinions, I should say, with Dr. Tim Fallis from Hawaii Pacific University. Thanks for staying. Oh, no worries. Yeah. Um, so now let me ask you this. 
we live in now a society that has many divergent opinions. We continue as um, the United States to have the right not only to, to have opinions, but to speak those opinions. How do we do it in a way that doesn't add a layer of toxicity, disrespect, verbal violence, and things like that into the workplace, the classroom, the media? How, how, do, we, how do we be nice to people who, that we disagree with? Right. I think there's three things that you can do. Um, the first is to proceed, as you say, from a position of respect respecting other people's right to have an opinion. Um, and from the receiver side, realizing that the person you're speaking to and disagree with has a right to his or her opinion also. That that opinion is not necessarily an indicator of that person's value as a human being or worthiness of being considered. Mm -hmm. um, the second part is um, trying to reach for things you can agree with. Mm -hmm. um, trying to reach for what we call in the polycom world consensual fact. Okay, so then we have this issue. Let's discuss health care. Great. Do we want to have national health care? All right, we're the only country except Somalia, which is a failed state that doesn't have health care. Maybe we should work on that. Um, let us proceed from what is national health care. Uh, what are sick people? Um, how much does it cost? What kind of taxes? We, let's figure that out and then decide whether we want to do it. Mm -hmm. um, if we don't decide what, what those factors are, the, Congress has, has voted a few times, and let's recount the 60 odd times during the Obama administration, to repeal the AHCA uh, or amend it, as they're saying. This latest vote, which passed the House of Representatives, um, came off without a score from the Congressional um, Budget Office, which is kind of unprecedented, really. Um, for decades, Congress has counted on an evaluation by this nonpartisan committee, or it's not even a committee. Um, bureaucrats, right? Permanent government employees to figure out, okay, y'all drew up this law. This is what the law will do as best as we can figure out. Great. And then uh, representatives and senators can decide, all right, this is what it's going to do. Do we want it? Do we want that? Oh, no, we didn't want this thing. Well, how can we rewrite it? Let's fix it. Okay. Voted this thing without even that, that score. So you don't have this consensual fact to decide, all right, let us now proceed with values. Mm -hmm. Um, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, right, famously said, you're entitled to your own opinions, but not your own facts. Uh -huh. He didn't come up with that. Somebody else did. Um, but he repeated it often enough that he gets credit for it. Um, we need to establish what the facts are, and then we can decide whether what we want to do. If we can't agree that the sky is blue, we can't decide whether we want to paint a building to look like the sky, mm -hmm. right? Because we don't even agree what that color is. It doesn't make any sense. And then the third thing, I think, is to proceed from the knowledge that, or the, well, let's say the premise, that the person across from you is just as much a patriot, just as much an intelligent person, a good, civic, responsible human being as you are, mm -hmm. and wants the best for their family, their community, their country, perhaps even you know, the, the global community. They just have a different idea. And maybe it's not your job to convince them otherwise. Mm -hmm. Maybe it, as we discuss these things, we should get away from the notion that I need to persuade you that you are wrong and that I am right mm -hmm. and, and persuade you that you should change your mind and instead just share with you what I think and really listen to you, right? It's the other half of communication we don't spend nearly enough time talking about and probably the better half. Really listen to what you have to say and then just let it be mm -hmm. and, and understand why you I believe why you do. Let me tell you how I believe or why I believe the way I do, and let that go. Uh, and not necessarily be so fixated on having to change that person's mind. Mm -hmm. And I think that that allows for dialogue that can maybe have an effect down the road, maybe not, but at least things have been aired out and there still is a sense of comity, of, of respect um, without rancor and, and bitterness. Right. But maybe we ought to take it, um, say, one layer deeper. You mentioned mm -hmm. let's start with consensual fact. But if we're talking about things like health care, uh, since, since that's the topic mm -hmm. that we're using to make this point, what if we started from a basic premise of um, philosophical commonality or value mm -hmm. commonality that says that all people have a right 
to be healthy, mm -hmm. and when they're not healthy, to get the care they need to either restore their health or to um, eradicate their pain and suffering. Mm -hmm. Okay, so basic premise. You and I probably agree, or, or could agree, that this is true. I think you and I agree that that's true. Right. I think that is not necessarily a national feeling. But if we could. But I, but I'm, I suggest that if we said, mm -hmm. I think you and I both agree that mm -hmm. when people are sick, they have a right to go to a doctor, how that becomes a part of the social fabric of our community is now the topic of conversation. So do we say that you can have the health care you can pay for mm -hmm. yourself out of pocket? Or do we say that uh, the private sector should step in with charities and nonprofit type of organizations to provide that care for those who cannot pay? Um, the how becomes the debate. Mm -hmm. Not the what or the why, but rather the how. Um, because I think questions of process are a lot less threatening, maybe, oh, than, for sure. than, than questions of philosophy or values. I agree. Um, if, we could, if we could make those agreements, then mm -hmm. we'd be way, way, way ahead. Mm -hmm. um, at this point, a lot of those agreements are difficult. And, I, and again, it goes back to the first question we talked about. Why are people so worked up and, and angry and, and find it so hard to be pleasant? Um, because those ideologies are very much in, in clash at the moment. Um, you can read pronouncements from congressmen and business leaders saying, hey, listen, if you don't have health insurance, it means you didn't, you didn't do it right. You didn't do life right. You didn't work hard enough. You didn't get the right job. You didn't get the right education. You blew it. And of course, if you've studied you know, anything about the way that society works, you know that that's specious. That doesn't work. Mm -hmm. um, lots of people work hard. Lots of people have not done anything wrong and still don't have those opportunities. Um, and you and I both know people that are well educated, that are well trained, that that wear the masks mm -hmm. of appropriateness in society, and are still having a hard time and are still suffering. Absolutely. So, so specious is part of the argument, but the other part of the argument is, to what degree do we actually know what the needs and challenges are, not only that we have, but that our neighbors have? It's a huge problem. It, yeah. It's a huge problem. Um, I like to think that I'm an enlightened fellow and I consider other people's... I grew up in California, um, a mostly Latino town. I never really understood what racism was or how it existed or how people thought like that because I didn't see it. It wasn't part of my experience. Right. At one point I went to a business thing in Minnesota, went to a baseball game, <laughs> and was really very confused because everyone... I couldn't figure it out for a while. What, why is this so strange? Well, everyone's white. I mean, the only people of color were the baseball players. I mean, really. And then I, I went to graduate school in West Philadelphia. I moved from, from KO to West Philadelphia, and I realized, okay, I'm living in an all-black community, um, really, except me, and um, really saw, okay, how institutionalized racism works. But if you're sitting in, in KO, or you're sitting in San Francisco, or you're sitting in Des Moines, and this is an enormous nation, and it's very, very difficult to appreciate how other people's lives are different. Not just that they are different, but how they are different. Uh, little things. I, I teach a writing class, an upper division writing class. And I'm typically unimpressed with how students are writing is when we start this course. And one of the things that I teach them is, listen, you all got to read a lot more. You just got to read. I don't care what you read. You don't have to read Dante. I mean, read good housekeeping. Read people. Read National Geographic. It's all good. Just read. Because then you'll recognize what good reading looks like. That's the whole theory. And I, I'm giving this speech for a couple of years before I realized most of these kids have grown up in households where they don't have regular newspaper delivery. They don't have regular magazine delivery. It's not part of their household culture. That's a small thing and an easy thing to fix. And of course, yes, there's libraries and whatnot. But if, if that's a small thing has such a big effect, right, then imagine what the effect of living in a neighborhood with a lousy school, with no parks, where it's dangerous to go out at dark. Um, those things have a, an enormous effect also. And we, we have to figure out a way to understand everyone else's position. Mm -hmm. And that's very difficult to do unless you have the means to travel or you have the means to visit other places or, or bring other people to you and listen to their stories. Empathy, I think, is, is a huge part of what we're missing now mm -hmm. in our political debates. Um, and civility, right? When we don't really teach civility outside of the home, outside of the family unit, 
um, we know how to argue, but we don't know how to be nice. Mm -hmm. We don't know how to respect other people's opinions. I'm sorry, respect their right to an opinion while disrespecting the opinion itself. And part of that is just not understanding other people's contingencies, understanding other people's journeys in life. But maybe it's a, a question of coming back to this issue of, you said, respect the right to an opinion, but not. But you could disrespect the opinion. Mm -hmm. I would venture the opinion mm -hmm. that it's probably not the best idea even to disrespect the opinion, mm -hmm. but rather to look for the logic in it. I don't agree with you, but using the facts that you've used to construct this idea, I can see where you've drawn the conclusion. Now, I use an entirely different logic right. in order to come to my decision. Um, but if I were using yours, I can see where I might decide differently. Well, that's the most excellent way to approach it. I mean, that would be great. Um, and probably disrespecting people's opinion is the wrong term. I think you can disagree, mm -hmm. and that's okay. Mm -hmm. But if you can figure out a way to understand why the person you're disagreeing with comes to that conclusion, that's fantastic. And that's an extension of admitting that the other person is just as intelligent, patriotic, enlightened, and well-meaning as you are. Right. Yes, you're absolutely right. And I do think the other side of that, too, has got to be a remembrance that not everybody has or comes from the same set of experiences. Um, I grew up on the sugar plantation in Waipahu, and even though I grew up there, we had plenty of books mm. growing up. Um, library cards, uh, books in the house. My parents subscribed to magazines and newspapers. We got the Reader's Digest quarterly oh, assortment yeah. of books. So we always had plenty to read, and it was an expectation that the kids would do so. In mm -hmm. fact, I'm ancient now, and I still have for myself the summer reading program. Nice. Um, so these things become habit. Mm -hmm. uh, but I can't honestly say that my classmates have that same uh, kind of emphasis on reading, study, and expanding your world by examining the worldviews of others. Right. And, yeah. and it takes a while to realize that everyone didn't have the same opportunities you did growing mm -hmm. up. But I mean, if your yeah. parents weren't into that, it wouldn't have been there. That's true. Mm -hmm. You know, we've only got a minute left, so what I'd like you to do, Tim, is um, give us some advice for diffusing the relative um, sturm and drang around political disagreement. What can we do to, to um, quiet the, uh, the tide? I think the best thing we can do is to relax about feeling the need to convince everyone else that our opinions are the best one. I don't think we need to convince everyone that they're wrong. We don't need to convince other people to have a different opinion. I think we need to just calmly explain what our opinion is and calmly listen and then let that be. Mm -hmm. uh, your coworker is still a nice person that you've been working with for years, even if they think that um, Donald Trump is, is a marvelous, marvelous president, and you don't. Um, your, your mom is still your mom, your brother is still your brother. You hated him before, you can hate him now, but it doesn't have to be about <laughs> politics. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I love my brother, by the way. Um, he's a great guy. I, I think we just need to calm down, mm -hmm. really, and respect that other people's values and beliefs are just as well-meaning as ours are. Yeah. You know, that's, that's actually really good advice, especially the comment about brothers, because we've all got them. Yeah. And we like them kind of in a floating kind of way. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't. So thank you for joining us. Um, we are going to take off, but we'll be back in two weeks. Uh, this is Working Together on Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Cheryl Crozier-Garcia, and we will see you in two weeks. Thank you. Bye-bye.